There are so many more artists than there are opportunities. Yes, opportunities do come. It took years for them to come to me, but the first ones had to be self-facilitated. You have to carve your own path through which your career can go. She said, we should probably do a press release. This was the night before we finished it and photographed it. I was like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then, my word, the response was crazy. Absolutely crazy. There was news crews everywhere. It just broke me. Absolutely broke me. Most days I was doing 20 hour days, 21 hour days. And I would just, most nights I would just wake up just almost screaming. Welcome to the Installation Art Podcast, the world's number one podcast about installation art and the people who make it. I am super excited about today's guest. Even if you haven't heard his name, you will have seen his work. It's been featured on Colossal, Design Boom, and pretty much everywhere else. In 2019, his installation in Milan was the most Instagrammed public artwork. Some people call him an architectural wizard. Alex Chinnick is a British artist who makes sculptures and public art on a monumental scale. His work is humorous and playful, and it looks unreal as it defies gravity and laws of physics. Just looking at the scope and size of his urban interventions gives me heart palpitations. The amount of planning and work and budgets involved in making it all happen is mind-blowing. Alex has made building facades slide down, unzip, crack in half, and melt. I cannot wait to share with you how he got started with his art and how his ideas become reality. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Alex Chinnick. Thanks so much, Alex, for saying yes to this. I'm a bit of a fangirl myself, so like... Thanks for asking me. And it's, it's music to my ears that you're a fan. Honestly, these projects are so bloody hard sometimes. It's nice to know that people are seeing them and enjoying them genuinely. I know I'm supposed to say that, but honestly, I mean that. It's nice to hear. So thank you. Thank you. Let's have a little warm up, silly questions round. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? That's a real, <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to think I'm a four, but I think if you ask my studio manager and my wife, it would be eight, nine. That's in, in your head, it feels normal, right? <laughs> like everything feels like a good idea yeah. and makes sense. But the two people who really tell me the truth think I'm a bloody idiot. So I guess I'm either in the middle and say six. Sure, yeah. we'll go with that. Do you have a favorite quote? Well, I, hmm, in, in the context of my work, it's only the paranoid survive. In the sense, yeah, only the paranoid survive. That feels applicable. I mean, I'm quite an anxious practitioner. And the way I kind of deal with everything is just to work so hard. So... I guess, and that keeps kind of a degree of anxiety in a sense of keeping this kind of depressing notion of not fulfilling possibility and potential at bay. So only the paranoid survive. But I think in the context of the world at present, it's probably the quote that comparison is the thief of joy. I think that so much of the, mm -hmm. the world, so much of our ill will and ill health to a degree comes from comparison. And the illusion that your neighbor has a better life than your own because of what they did or what they have. And it's, it's all a kind of artificial projection. And the danger of hype, particularly in the creative sector. So yeah, comparison is the thief of joy and only the paranoid survive. Both really positive. <laughs> Sorry, they're quite negative quotes. <laughs> Very British of you. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm trying to come from a positive place in saying them. What's your favorite beverage in the studio? If it's before like 6 p.m., it would be biscuit tea. I drink this thing called biscuit tea now, and it's tea that tastes of biscuits. Okay. It's so good. It's kind of malty. It's so delicious. 
So, mm. but, and it stops I'm eating this. Like I've become obsessed with the gym and everything like that. So now I don't, it stops me from eating biscuits. It kind of, it, it satisfies a craving. So biscuit tea, it's really good. I have not heard that one before and I would love yeah. to try it. <laughs> I should send you a box. It's delicious. Okay. Um, and if you weren't an artist, what would you be? Antique dealer. A hundred percent. My passion is making sculptures. Don't get me wrong. You have a lot of antiques. Yeah. I'm a real collector of antiques. I've collected folk art for years. It's got very popular, which is great for the dealers, but frustrating for the collectors, I suppose. But folk art and Welsh, Irish, Gustavian, Swedish furniture. I collect antiques and I'd be an antique dealer. I love it. It's a real treasure hunt. There's just timelessness. And my favorite form of painting is time. And it sounds so deeply pretentious. But the thing I love more than anything is weathered and worn color, where it's kind of color has taken on an age and it just um, just accumulates utter charm in storytelling. And I, I just love antiques for that. So I'd be an antique dealer. Okay. Uh, absolutely. I probably still might be. Like I some like <laughs> I quite often think a side hustle. Well, not even a side hustle, just the hustle. And the sculpture becomes the side hustle. I think probably most weeks, oh, I should just, just stop this and go for it and become an antique dealer sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Let's start from the very beginning. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the UK in a small town in a county called Bedfordshire. It's perfectly placed in the sense that it's about a 40-minute train journey north of London. So I grew up mm -hmm. there, and it was great. And were you a creative kid? No, no. I mean, I was interested in how things worked. So I was brilliant at taking things apart and just pathetic at putting them back together. So I, I was that idiot that gets some incredible, like I, I got this racing game for Christmas. It was like a unit, and it had a steering wheel and a little screen on it. And I just, I had to understand how it was made. So I took it apart, put it back together. And there was about eight pieces left that weren't reinserted and it didn't work again. So no, I was kind of, kind of technically clumsy. I was curious. I was a curious kid, I guess, but I wasn't particularly creative. So I actually grew up playing sport. That was my thing. And then um, as I got into my teens, I, I fell in love with painting. I wasn't particularly good at it, but I was in love with the, the kind of meditative escapism that it offered me. I have a busy mind, so I just fell in love with just becoming lost in a process. And for me, that was painting. Mm -hmm. And so you went to study painting? I did. Yeah, yeah. So I left school. I mean, I just, I loved it. It's all I did. It was all I did. Every lunchtime after mm -hmm. school, I was in the art whole time. I just loved it. And looking back, they weren't good paintings, but it just felt right. Something about the process of making art just felt so right. So I went to art school in London. I went to Chelsea College of Art and I did a foundation, but then I ended up doing a degree there. So I was there for four years. And I, I very quickly stopped making paintings. When I got to Chelsea after a term, it moved to its current location, which is opposite the Tate Britain which is vast, vast site. And the thing that they'd unquestionably invested most into was the workshops. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I fell into making, I got into making things and I just spent all of my time in the workshops there, just mucking around with materials and machines. And that was, that was crucial. And that's how I migrated into sculpture, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was still making paintings in a way. I still make paintings, really. They're sculptures. They're very material. You know, it's, there's a lot of material going on, a lot of making. But I still think quite like a painter. For example, I made this piece called Telling the Truth Through False Teeth, which is 312 identically smashed and cracked windows. Yep. It's a building. Like, there were, a lot of them are buildings, but it's very much about facade an affrontage. So it took me a long time to start thinking, oh, there's actually a back to a sculpture or there's a side to a sculpture. That took me quite a long time to get into that place. Ah. But yeah, I mean, the paintings, it's always kind of stuck with me. And I always want to go back to painting. Like one day I will get back to painting. But yeah, sculpture just keeps getting in the way. So 
Yeah, art school was good. I was pleased to leave it, though. I was really pleased to leave it. Why? Well, there's just too <laughs> many artists. I know I am one. But just, I don't know. I just didn't feel like it was... Um, I think it, it, served, it played a very important role. And I developed kind of a language around art. And I developed a thicker skin in terms of critique, which is so important, mm -hmm. particularly when you're public art in the public realm. Um, you yeah. need a thick skin because it's easy to forget the compliments and you always remember the insults. So it, mm -hmm. it gave me a robustness. And it certainly gave me a kind of um, an ability to waffle pretentiously. <laughs> Here we are. You're bathing in that right now. <laughs> but I, um, I just didn't find it productive. It just wasn't a productive place. I mean, I can't explain it in the sense... I just didn't feel like it was an environment that was designed around making work. It just felt like a world that was kind of conceived about just talking about work. Yeah, very academic. Yeah, and I had no appetite for an MA. I was so pleased to leave. It's not a criticism of art schools. It's just my relationship with them. And they've changed so much. I went back to Chelsea College of Art recently, and it just, the bar had closed, and the studios were empty, and it, it just felt a little bit lifeless. I mean, I'm not best to comment on it, but I think it's possible that the kind of spark and the spirit that art schools once famously had has perhaps diminished and um, they're a little bit exhausted. And because of necessity, they've become such commercial operations. Perhaps some of the creativity in the bohemia has gone, which is a shame. And I just enjoyed getting out into the world, I suppose. So, what did you do after school? So, The first thing I did was I took on, with two friends, a factory unit. This is a bit cliche now, but back in the time, we were the first people to take on a unit in this, this factory building in East London, a huge complex of factories. And we were the first people to do that. So built a four or five bedroom apartment in this factory building. And we lived there extremely inexpensively. This is so hard in London now. I just don't even know. I don't even think this is possible in London now. But at the time, there was still the outskirts of the city and the opportunity to do this and live extremely inexpensively. And then there was two toilets downstairs in this factory building. There was the, the men's toilets and the women's toilets. And I went to the factory owners and I asked them if I could refurbish the toilets or gut the toilets. And uh, we got them for free. So because these were disgusting, it's just horrible. So I gutted them and my good friend took the female toilet and I had the male toilets. And um, that was my studio for four years and it was completely mm -hmm. free. That gave me space and opportunity to make work. So for income, I went and worked for another artist, British sculptor, Comrade Shawcross, and um, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. I made tremendous friends. One particularly remains one of my closest friends, an artist called David Murphy, a British artist, brilliant artist. And Conrad was just brilliant. It was such an amazing environment to learn. He chucks you in the deep end, and he's extremely ambitious. I always say I learned ambition from him. Ambition is contagious. You're not born with ambition, you're taught it. And I think the best way to learn ambition is through osmosis and just being in the company of an utterly ambitious innovator. Um, and Conrad was that, and it it was such an important environment. And I got to travel with Conrad, and that was great. And you really learn. And I say this with the greatest respect. I mean, this is nothing against Conrad. This is in any environment in that way. You learn the kind of artist you want to be, and you also learn the kind of artist you don't want to be. And it, it absolutely helped to mold the the kind of creative direction that I wanted to take. And I learned more in that environment in a kind of ambitious, technical, and operational environment like that. I learned more there in three months than I did in three years at art school, without a doubt. It was brilliant. You know, and then I was there for four days a week, then three days a week, then two days a week, and then I got to a point where I neither needed to be there or probably should have been there because I began to expand commercially and creatively. So, but a really, really wonderful foundation in terms of Conrad. Yeah. Mm.
what was your first big opportunity to show your work or make make an installation? Well, it wasn't really an opportunity. It was self-facilitated. The thing I always bang on about is there's so many more artists. There's so many more artists than there are opportunities. Yes, opportunities do come. It took years for them to come to me, but the first ones had to be self-facilitated. You have to carve your own path through which your career can go. Particularly if you're making work that doesn't sit neatly within the appetite and trends of the of the commercial art sector. So I immediately realized that the real art form was self-facilitation. That's the real art form. Um, fabrication is one thing. The art of facilitation is a whole different thing. It's more important. It is more important. So I'd been mucking around for a long time. And with lots of different materials, lots of different processes. And I was working in a smaller way. So I was, I was using the materials of the built environment, brick, steel, concrete, glass. And I was making smaller works. They were nice, like really nice investigations and studies and such, but they felt like they belonged in an architectural context and not a gallery context. Mm. So I was having lots of shows and stuff, but people weren't really that excited about the work. They were, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't kind of striking the right response that I was seeking, I guess, which was one of people, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It was a very important time in terms of learning materials and processes and accumulating partners. So in terms of the construction industry or uh, the sector of, of manufacturing, they had a lot of resources. Can't really speak for now. Like, for example, bricks. Bricks is the best example here. I wanted to make kind of studies with bricks. So I went to Ibstock Brick and I did this with company after company after company and just said, look, I'm trying to make these curious things. Can I have the bricks and your expertise and the, the materials for sure and some of your processes like water jet cutting machines and stuff for free? And in exchange, you know, I'll make these curious things and you, you know, you have the photos and maybe there's some marketing material at the end of it. Mm. And they all began to agree. Did you explicitly tell them that this is for an art project or did you phrase it some other way? Yeah, I always said it was for an art project. Yeah. Like I had absolute, utter kind of enthusiasm and whimsy and I think it, they, they warmed to it. This wasn't when I was making big stuff, yeah. but I, I developed the ability to pull work off. This was it. It was just basically facilitating a platform through materials, partners, inexpensive existence to make work. That's what it was always about. Love that. And collaboration. So at art school, I wanted to make some work that involved motion sensors. It was this performing minimalist work, and I called it Donald and the Judds. And it was such a good title. And I didn't have the uh, computing ability to do that. So I went to Imperial College, which is a very kind of science-based college. And I, I found a kind of computing club. And I met this brilliant programmer called Stefan, very clever man who did all the computer work with me. And I immediately realized how creatively liberating it is to partner with other abilities. I know that sounds really obvious now, but at art school, it, there was this real sense of um, it had to come from your mind and it had to come from your hands. And no one else could kind of feed into that. I set myself free by essentially saying, I need to conceive something, as a, I need to conceive an idea and then the challenge is about working out how I create it. One of the kind of the greatest mechanisms to overcome those other schools is collaboration. And yeah. that, that's, that's been the root of my practice, I suppose. So, yeah, I've always enjoyed that idea of working with others technically, creatively, you know, in terms of design. So um, the first piece that really made sense was the identically smashed windows. This was 312 of identically smashed and cracked windows, 1,248 pieces of glass. I'd been mucking around with this in the studio, but essentially what I was doing was I was taking smashed glass, digitally scanning it, and then reproducing it hundreds and hundreds of times. I'd done a kind of butterfly effect of it in my studio with two windows that hung on the wall. But this is my point. I was kind of like, this is beautiful, but it needs to be in an architectural situation. That's where it belongs the narrative and the materiality and context is everything it's an illusion and the, the strength of an illusion hinges on its believability so if you can introduce it into the material world in the appropriate context it is so much more powerful so that's what i did i 
wrote to a glass company and they sponsored the glass. But the problem was, was finding the right factory. Yeah. And there was this fantastic factory in Hackney, in East London, that just was this beautiful brick roof of the building that had all of these identical windows. It wasn't easy, but I was allowed to use it. Eventually, it was ending demolition, which was perfect. Uh, but it was a Sri Lankan made man called Bala who owned a nearby petrol station who owned this fantastic building. He knocked it down. But yeah. um, I love that they come and go. So basically, I removed all of the glass and installed all of this glass. And it took weeks and weeks and weeks. And the building was full of asbestos. And the building had been used to grow cannabis. So it was three f- floors of just fertilized pebbets and lamps and plugs. There was foxes in there. But I removed all the windows and installed those didn't really think about it like i was just doing an artwork for me it was just another artwork it's just accidentally i'd stumbled into something that was public facing massive it was lots of small parts that became a big artwork rather mm-hmm. than now just cranes and foundations and construction companies and all of that rubbish that we deal with now it was so wonderfully simple and it, it the logistics took care of themselves the cost took care of itself. It was very inexpensive. All I needed was time. And I always gave bucket loads of that and um, pulled it off. And the response was fantastic. Like it was suddenly in the papers and there was hundreds and hundreds of people going to visit this building. Mm. Kind of that was it. That was it. I'd made a public artwork. I'd made an architectural public artwork kind of by accident. Not by accident in terms of the, the production of it, but like, I didn't set out to make a public artwork. It just was one. And I loved it. I loved it. So that was it. That was the start. Wow. That's pretty cool. So you kind of found that building owner yourself and got in touch with him yourself and were like, hey, can I change your windows? Oh, I did everything myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, as I say, the real art form is facilitation. That was always how it was. It still is. It weirdly still is. Like, don't get me wrong. I work with lots of people. Um, I lo- work with lots of, lots of brilliant people. And every single one of them is better at that area than I am. <laughs> you know, yeah. every single area I work in, that person is better than me at it. Mm-hmm. But it still, it still always weirdly just comes back to me at the end of the day, desperately trying to pull it off. Desperately trying to pull it off. It's strange, even when the, I don't know, I don't really like talking about budgets and the money side of things, but even when there is, like if any artist would say this, and any artist should say this, if you, if you give me a budget of 10 pounds, I'll design something that costs 11. Every bloody time. <laughs> Every time. So, and, so then you've just got to beg, borrow, and steal that extra pound. But I think that's probably the best way to play it. I'd rather do it mm. that way, I think. Over deliver. What stemmed from that project in Hackney? What came from that was maybe this is a bit superficial, but it's incredible how energizing positive attention can be. You know, like being an artist is a bit of a slog, and it's very easy to feel great about being a creative practitioner when you have the kind of the wings of positivity and the kind of airstream of momentum and compliments behind you. For a lot of years before that, no one cared. People probably still don't. But I was energized by attention, which is a real shame, but it's the truth. And uh, I felt an, an incredible sense of limitless possibilities. Now, this was naive, but wonderful naivety. Experience be a real pay to creative freedom. Yeah. You just learn the reasons why something can't happen. So I had no experience, and I was full of energy and ideas and optimism. I still am, but it's different now. What was great was everything was simple sculpturally. The things we make now are so complicated sculpturally. We're actually making a conscious effort to return to a greater formal simplicity. Mm-hmm. Basically, I, I designed a house. Like I, I started drawing a house where the front slid off. Right? So mm-hmm. brick out, front slid down. 
And this stemmed again from the kind of material investigations I'd been doing previously. Now, this was amongst other things I was working on, but that was the main one. So I just drew it and I thought, okay, all I need now is a house that I can rip the front off, um, whatever it was, 4,000 spoke bricks or something. I don't know, I can't remember what it And structural engineer, steel fabricator, blah, blah, blah. Went on and on and on and on. Didn't even think about planning permission, all of these different things. I was just like, that's all I need now. And I, I spent about a year pulling that off in the sense like I would just write to everyone and anyone and beg, borrow, and steal. And it, it became the sliding house, which is called From the Knees of My Nose to the Belly of My Toes. I ended up getting everything free. I got the bricks for free. I got the timber for free. Um, I got the construction team for free from a local contractor. Actually, we paid them a tiny bit of money. Amongst other things, I got the structural engineering for free. How did you pull that off? I just beg. Like, it's so different. Now. I couldn't do this now. Because of my portfolio, I can't do this now. And I shouldn't do this now, in a way. Got the crane for free. Got everything for free. But the one thing that particularly comes to mind is a structural engineer, a brilliant structural engineer, wrote to me, and he was doing a blog. And he said, can I put this on a blog? And it was one of my studies. I said, yeah. Then I wrote back to him and we started a conversation and he agreed to do the structural engineering for the sliding house without charge. I didn't even know I needed a structural engineer really at the beginning, but yeah, because sorry. you you've slid the front off and you've ripped the top, you, you've got uplift so that, that the roof would blow off. Anyway, his name was Simon Smith from an engineering company called Smith and Woolwork Engineers. And they've been working with me for ever since. Oh. I, it, Simon and I work on every single project together and obviously not for free yeah. um, although it sometimes feels like that him I'm sure but it he became a fantastic collaborator and we we pulled that one off now also another thing was the house like that's a freaking big thing to do like get a house now yeah. I, I wrote to lots of different people but I really wanted to put it in Margate Margate was really interesting it's in Kent it's a seaside town Without getting into the kind of the demographics of the, the people there, it was a very interesting town in a degree of flux because of the arrival of Turner Contemporary Gallery. It just arrived there. So there was something very interesting happening there. But it was once a very, very affluent area. It was, it was where real affluence of, the, of, of London would, go, would holiday there. Mm -hmm. So it had these very grand properties, but lots of different factors. The, the properties had been abandoned or fallen into neglect. And a lot of these properties had gone within the council's portfolio. Anyway, over a period of time, I developed a relationship with someone who was working there at the council, but she was appointed by English Heritage and Arts Council England to manage the, the kind of introduction of the gallery into the area. But she was working within the council. Her name is Sophie, and she was brilliant. She essentially guided the creative path or the administrational path to allow council to give me that building for a year or so to create that artwork and rip the front off. And the moment I saw that building with her, we walked around Margate, and showed me all the different properties. I just fell in love with it and I knew it was right. And she made it happen. And she's been my studio manager ever since. Wow, that's so cool. So the two people I'd have spoken to most, without doubt, over the last you know many years, is Simon and Sophie. And both of them I met in that one project and we pulled it off i mean like i i, I breathe over a lot of things and sophie let me stay at her house for three months over the summer to do it she was brilliant like and she didn't know me she just took this this chance on me i mean now today i'd be lost without her. she's my colleague uh, my business partner one of my best friends my therapist you know like i'd be totally lost without her and so she helped me pull that project off it was brilliant and it was bloody hard. Like, I'm not, I mean, honestly, pulling that off was hard. But we got there and I didn't, again, I didn't really know. I didn't really know what the hell I was doing. And then she said, we should probably do a press release. This was like the night before we finished it and photographed it. I was like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then, my word, the response was crazy. Absolutely crazy. Like two days later, we went back there. There was news crews everywhere. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey, I want to quickly share a resource that makes this podcast possible. It's a program called Descript. That's what I use to record, to edit, create transcripts, and much more. And honestly, I don't know if I could even do this podcast without it. The script just makes audio and video editing so much less daunting. If you do any editing at all, you'll definitely want to check it out. With Descript, you're not just editing abstract waveforms, but the actual script, as in a Word document. And repurposing content is also really easy, for example, turning long-form video into vertical social media clips. Check out the link, I've put it in the show notes and on our website, so you can try it out for yourself. I've always really loved the idea of accessibility. Like, I love the idea of conceptual accessibility, where if you're placing something in the public realm, um, I try to, I don't consciously strip it out. I've always gravitated to work like this, but I champion the idea of kind of stripping out any degree of elitism, whether it's kind of creative elitism or particularly intellectual elitism. And the work is extremely complicated to produce, but simultaneously, it can be easily understood. And yeah. I've always loved that idea. And um, it's never been a strategy. It's always been a philosophy. And there's a big difference. It's not about, oh, we need to get this funding or please these people or, or the optics need to be positive here. It was just always, I, I just love the idea that lots of people can enjoy it. So the day after we finished it, Sophie had organized a road closure and we'd done an, an invitation drop to all the houses around in multiple languages. And everyone came and we had this, kind of weird zero budget street party <laughs> and the only thing we'd offer was like this lovely guy gave us his cherry picker free while we were doing it so we just toned it off and the kids all had cherry picker rides the idea was that they'd see the artwork but they would just uh, surround like they didn't really care about the artwork so that was cool we did that and the day after it was just the street was just full of news crews it was in every single paper all the news channels and I honestly, that was not the plan. That was not the plan. Yeah. And it got this huge media response and it continues to get a colossal media response. It, it's a funny one that like we're now actually going back to making work like that. But I had to take the departure away from it. Like the worst thing I could have done after that project was carry on making sliding houses. Mm -hmm. That would have been the worst thing I could have done. Like I happened to nail it early on. Like in terms of public artwork, it's pretty, it's a bloody good one in the sense that it was contextually spot on, like it felt like it fitted within the environment. It's playful, um, it's big. The narrative is easy to understand, but it's technically deliverable. Like Frank Gehry always says, the brilliant architect, he says something like, no bend is $1, one bend is $2, two bends is $10. And I was in the one bend territory where it's like, just bend it in one plane. I, I now am, I'm in like the 50 bend territory, which is <laughs> yeah. just, just spread like. So I nailed it. I absolutely nailed it. An artwork that still continues to have wonderful reach. But yeah, it was crazy. And then that was there for about eight months. And then it got vandalized. And it's like, oh no. What happened? I got vandalized. Like kids just went over and smashed it up a bit. Mm. And like the council were getting nervous because I finished it and this massive skateboard company. Like, right, the first person to do a drop on this gets free merchandise. I was like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> no, don't say that. So all the kind of anxieties of just worrying about, like, I didn't know about good design at the time. I think I do now. Yeah, it got vandalized, repaired it, and then it got knocked down, which was perfect. It was always going to be. That's the thing. Buildings that are pending demolition give you such creative freedom because people aren't precious about them. So yeah, we pulled that off and that was great. And then, as I say, I haven't made a sliding house since. I, I will, absolutely will. And I will do smash windows, but you have to, yeah, apps, oh, it's so tempting. Repetition is tempting. The comfort, the creative and the commercial comfort of repetition is so tempting, but it's while you're a young practitioner full of ideas and energy, you've got to reject that temptation. That's the way I say it. Right. Okay. So yeah, that was what happened. 
So how did you go from that to having to hire a team? And how do these projects get funded now? Well, then after that project, the invitation started. And mm -hmm. this was a time when, it wasn't that long ago, but it was, it was when the, the philosophy of placemaking was kind of taking off. So the timing was good. I think it was about 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, nine, eight. Yeah, exactly. So now we're getting into like hovering building territory, which was, I think, about eight years ago now. And it was an interesting time. Like the idea of placemaking was just taking off. So commissioners like the London Design Festival, which was great, the, the commissioners really were developers. It was really developers. Really? Yeah, property developers, like big property developers. And I had about three years where no one was really making work like me. And I, I like to think no one still is, right? It, it's very, very hard to make this work mm -hmm. and to pull this work off. It's really, really, really hard. I mean, Rachel White's house is just is a masterpiece and Richard Wilson's turning the place over is a masterpiece. And Matter Clark's energy and risk and ambition was it all those 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 three things really charged me. Um but there wasn't many people and there still isn't many people making work like this, where it's deeply sculptural in this sense, not decorative. You know, you can make work that's kind of cheap, cheerful, and easy to deliver all day long. It's very hard to make work that's expensive, challenging, and very, very hard to deliver. Um, mm -hmm. It requires utter obsession. But apart from pulling off other things, I had invitations, but at the same time, there was still the window of opportunity to self-facilitate. So what I'm getting at is, for example, Covent Garden invited me to create an artwork for the Piazza. Now, that was the first artwork that had a proper budget. I went over it, completely went over it. So stressful. But that's where we created the hovering building, which was basically this huge illusion of a building that was hovering. And the footfall to that was absolutely enormous, enormous. It was there for 30 days. The footfall increased by about a million. It was on the national news in 35 different countries. The footfall was huge. And that was when the engineering challenge, structurally, that one was, was a bit of a beast. That involves kind of engineering know-how and risk. Um, but we pulled that off. Yeah, as I said, it was developers really coming to us then, and then there were budgets. And it kind of grew from there in companies. And there was this period of, of okay, so I did the sliding house, the upside-down building, which is this huge upside-down building, the hovering building, yeah. Uh, the Peeling Road, where a car hangs upside down, which was paid for by writers, and which we then moved to Sheffield to show for free. We paid for it to go to Sheffield and show it in an area that really wouldn't expect to find a public artwork of that kind. Um, and the Melting House. The Melting House, I think, probably over time, materializes my best work. That was a house made of 7,500 wax bricks. Amongst all of those, they were all being commissioned, but the Melting House wasn't. I'll go back to the Melting House in a minute. Pulled off all of those pieces within a period of about 18 months. What? Yeah, and then I had a nervous breakdown. And now, how I like pulling off those in 18 months, I, I can't tell you enough. This is not paint, it's not painting. This isn't murals. Wait, wait, wait. No, wait, wait, wait nothing wait, wait. against murals. Um, what do you mean by pulling off? Like, as in you completed all those start to finish yeah. in 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the sliding house, which, well, I finished the sliding house within that 18 months. The sliding house took a, like a year to facilitate, let's say. But yeah. yeah. Sliding house, down building, hovering building, melting house, peeling road, 18 months. Honestly, I mean, I can't even, like, it just broke me. Absolutely broke me. Because these were making no kidding minimal profit, if any, 
or losses. And I would just, most nights I would just wake up just almost screaming. And I was barely sleeping. When I did the hovering building, uh, the hovering building was on Covent Garden Piazza. And I would finish there and then I would walk from there to London Bridge to the Melting House. And most days I was doing 20 hour days, 21 hour days. Uh, you know, this isn't cool. Like, it, this is bad. I, I think if it, I'm going to kind of conclude with anything here, it's a warning on this to young practitioners. Look, I mean, any opportunity that was there, I would take it, right? Because I'd work friggin' hard to be given commissions and opportunities. So I wasn't going to miss them. I'm not wired that way. I'm still wired that way. I, you know, nothing has changed in terms of kind of being a workaholic. And then at the same time, my first child was born when we were doing The Melting House. And that was, um, there's an interview of me in The Guardian. And like, I'm doing it. And I think they say I'm a bit frazzled. And I was such a mess. And then I get a call and my wife's gone into labor. <laughs> anyway, I, I was going a million miles. I want to talk about the birthing house separately. So I keep thinking I've got to come back to that. Okay, I'll lead you back to it. Yeah, I did one small project after the, um, this isn't a sob story, by the way. It's not at all. You know, what wonderful problem. But I did one small project after feeling right and I just broke, just broke, had a, had a nervous breakdown. I mean, I was going, I don't know, 110, 120 hour weeks. Easy, easy. There wasn't a day where I wouldn't work. Non-stop, non-stop. And then you'd finish a work and we work with people, you know, obviously like the Common Garden Project we work with, I don't know, like there'd be in total 80 people involved. And the Covent Garden Project was stressful, took an enormous amount of risks. I was totally not experienced enough to deliver a work of that kind at the time. But like it was deep end. It was beautifully deep end. And like that's where you learn to swim, right? And so I've been trying to throw myself in lots of different deep ends for the last eight or nine years. You know, it was deep end. And I was too deep probably. And um, I had the manager at the Disney store threatening to sue me because we were blocking deliveries and That, that was just one of many, many, many things on that. Anyway, so this small project happened and I just broke. I just broke because I was going a million miles an hour. And people were warning me that, you know, there was this brilliant man, Dave the Scrap, who was a scrap metal collector who worked with me at the time. And he kept saying, you're going to do yourself a mischief. You're going to do yourself a mischief. And I, I just didn't listen. And I didn't take anything like that seriously, that potential mental fragility. I just didn't take it seriously at all. You didn't believe in burnout? Yeah, didn't didn't believe in it at all. Because the, the, my greatest asset is stamina, or it always was. And then, um, yeah, I mean, without going into details, I just broke. I just broke. You know when you watch a sprinter, and they're sprinting, and they kind of pull their hamstring, and they it's like they've been shot in the leg, because they just like scream and grab their... It was like that. I just went. And it knocked me out a long time. Knocked me out for like a year. Um, so there's a real change. You'll notice in my portfolio in the timeline, there's a real shift just because it, there had to be. And it, it immediately, well, not immediately, it took months to work out what the hell was going on. But the strategy had to change. It had to be about a long-term plan. It had to be um, like a long-distance race and not a sprint. It had to transition yeah. to a long-distance race. And I think if you look at a lot of practitioners, I don't know, there's not many like me, but I think if you looked at a lot of practitioners, there is a change. There's this initial introduction and impact. And with that comes a lot of hype. At that time, you have a lot of people coming to you trying to work with you, which is great and it's wonderful. And you've got to take those opportunities and you've got to maximize the ambition and risk. But there comes a point where there has to become a pivot where you start to transition into a longer game. And that breakdown, you know, the only breakdown I've had, I mean, was that forced pivot and a new strategy came a necessity basically and that set about that new chapter don't get me wrong since then we've still done the uh actually i think in that 18 month period maybe you could extend it to two years we did the upside down pylon as well but of course since then we've still done the spiral staircase which is a 35 meter unraveling spiral staircase which is that is a technical i'm gonna swear Uh, that's that's not easy. Um, and we've done all our unzipping buildings, of course. Our unzipping mm -hmm. building in Milan, which had 200,000 visitors across six days. Wow. That was mega. That, so it's, it, don't get me wrong, 
And we're, we're delivering some projects at the moment that are in that vein. Like, it's not like we've stopped making, taking huge risks. It just, they have to be appropriately spaced out and approached in the right way with the right team and the right collaborator. Yeah. So, yeah. So how long do you need for one project now? How long do you take to complete one? I, well, there's not really a fixed formula in that regard. Different factors affect that, like flow of cash from the commissioner, size of budget, therefore, I suppose, whether it is for a fixed deadline, whether it's temporary or permanent, and the various technical obstacles in the way. So we're delivering a project next summer, which is wonderful. It, it's, it, if I say so, much, it's a beauty of a sculpture. It's beautiful and it's permanent. I'm so excited about this artwork. Can you tell me more about it? Well, it goes on the water. I guess what I can say is it floats on the water on a canal system. That we've been working on for years, years. And even now, there's some very complicated things going on with regard to unexploded bombs and um, next to a rail line, underneath electricity power cables in a contaminated area. Uh, prehistoric mines underneath lots of stakeholders it's yeah. tricky that one is that's taken years whereas something like the zipping building in milan we did in three months you three know but like that, that had a team of 150 people yeah wow. but that had 150 people or something like that so there's lots of different there's lots of different we could do a sliding house in six months let's say Again, it's not about fabrication, it's the facilitator. That's the thing that takes time. The permission and the the property and the support. And that's the thing that takes time. But for example, our smaller works, like, okay, so we've just finished a twisting phone box. Yep. A twisting bronze phone box. Four years. It's taken four years. And that's wow. with Pangolin, one of the best found arguably the best foundry in the world. There's no formula. Now that we've made it, we can make them in nine months. That is an addition. We make the next ones in nine months. But uh, it takes, um, yeah, there's no real formula for that. But coming back, all I remember, come back to the Melting House. The Melting House was a crazy, crazy project. It was on a site where a candle making factory once stood in London. So it had this nice historical context. And we did it with um, Illuminate Productions. This was one that was funded. And so we had to really kind of really beg, borrow, and steal. We were given the land. And then we went to a local contractor, a massive local contractor who were working on the hospital in London Bridge, and they provided lots of technical support. But amongst loads of different things, we had to make the bricks. And we made wax windows and wax doors and everything like that. But we needed about 10 tons of wax. And I went to a wax company in Kent who were the biggest producer of leg wax, like hair wax pellets in Europe or something. Anyway, the owner of that, a man called Tony, this is Darren Wax, and Tony absolutely loved it. And you need to meet partners that are full of eccentricity and don't let logic get in the way of a terrible idea. You know? <laughs> so he helped me. And we went to all of these different wax companies around Europe asking for a ton of wax, 10 tons of wax. I all said no. So we went back to them and asked for a ton of wax. And they all said, yes. Yeah. So we had the wax. We had the wax. And we, we made 7,500 wax bricks, wax windows and wax doors and made the melting house. That was a great public experiment. That was a weird project. And some days it looked incredible. Some days it looked a mess. That was very weird. That made me nervous. Again, it's just the value of meeting these collaborators. And so today, like today, I'm going out for lunch with Tony He's coming here in two hours to pick me up because, you know, you make friends along the way and you make important collaborators and professional partners and stuff. So, um, yeah, that was an interesting project. But I guess what I'm saying with the, with the nervous breakdown thing is just, I know lots of people know this, just the caution when you're going a million miles an hour, you just degree of caution, I guess, and just being careful. So, yeah. How did you get out of the burnout and into being excited about making art again? Well, I left London 
and I moved to a farm in the Kent countryside, which is about 45 minutes from London. I mean, I don't know. Like, so in the last eight years, I've had three children. It was just about laying different foundations. So the farm was about thinking about the future in terms of space. The farm has lots of very big, exhausted buildings. It, it, the farm's become a huge project. And I, I remember watching the Anselm Kiefer documentary. It was the Imagine one by Alan Yentop, which is called Remembering the Future. Side note, the new Anselm Kiefer documentary that's been made by Wim... Wim Delvar. Yeah, and it's called Anselm that's just been shown at the Curzon. It was on show for about two weeks in the UK. I went four times. <laughs> the Anselm Kiefer, though, Remembering the Future, um, if anyone's listening to this and they're an artist or particularly a sculptor, you, just, you have to watch it. I think it's on Vimeo. You have to watch it. it it's mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. And the thing I fell in love with was just the, the world that he was creating. And it took many, it's taken decades. And I began to think that way, I suppose. So we moved to the farm and we started kind of building a world here. But with regard to the projects, it, it, they carried on, like I kind of healed, but we would take longer to create them. It became a lot more about design rather than kind of a flash impact. Mm -hmm. So the work kind of calmed down a little bit in theatricality. This was intertwined with things like the unzipping buildings, of course. So when I moved to Kent, I worked with a very good commissioner of mine uh, and collector of mine, and he owned some old industrial buildings near my farm. I took one of those and we ripped the front off and unzipped a small kind of 60s office block. Um, mm. This was before Milan. And so it was really yeah. nice. It was nice to make the work to a degree not commissioned. It, it was, I mean, it was commissioned, but it was nice to make a work on a, a kind of dilapidated, derelict building again. And um, we're doing quite a bit of that next year again. That's where I'm best, I think. When I have the permission and the freedom that an exhausted, unloved, unprecious building offers it, so it kind of picked up again but the, the big shift was beginning to make smaller works and this was both a creative and a commercial necessity so in terms of the creative i i needed more out i, I had a lot of ideas and um I, I have an appetite like as a sculptor i have this appetite that could never quite be fed or quenched it's this constant creative thirst and making lots of smaller works helps that. So yeah. we started making smaller works, but that embodied a lot of the sculptural narrative and language that the larger works have, particularly this idea of fluidity. And we also started saying yes to smaller internal projects. Like um, I did this lovely project in a museum in Germany where I created the illusion of a column being knotted. So it had these 450-year-old wooden columns in the museum. And I thought, oh, it'd be nice to not install anything and just create the illusion that we've just manipulated what was already materially present. That's kind of what sculpture is in a way. It's a reorganization of materials that already exist. I love this idea that you have a house that's completely built and exactly the same house that's just knocked down. It's exactly the same amount of material. It's just arranged differently. That's kind of what sculpture is, the, the kind of the reconfiguration and reimagination of the material world around us. That's the way I kind of try to pretentiously package it but yeah um so i created this knotted column and i loved the knot like i loved that i enjoyed the fluidity of it well i liked the contextual integration of this artwork into the setting but i particularly got excited about the knot in its three-dimensionality and the way it's constantly changing as you walk around it but it's yeah. also so simple but technically complicated so I saw the knot as an opportunity or as a, as a kind of an area that I thought that would be a neat way of developing a visual identity around that. I mean, if you think about a lot of different practitioners, they have a real visual identity. And up to that point, the work had been quite sparse in the sense, yes, it was, it was probably me. But the thing about my work is you might say to someone, do you know Alex Chinnick? And they'll say no. And then you'll show a picture and they'll say, oh, I've seen that. I've seen that. I've seen that. And then they'll say, well, did this person do those? And that's good and bad. Like I put a lot of stock in creative breadth. And I think I like to think that I've got plenty of time to refine and repeat later. Um, 
But I don't know, with the knot, I just thought this presents quite an interesting area of opportunity to develop a kind of visual identity around a knot. And it really chimed with me, this, this illusion of fluidity. And there's something quite interesting about a knot in terms of it. It's stopping something. So anyway, I set about making smaller work. So we made the knotted clocks in walnut and bronze, um, which is still ambitious. I mean, the, the, the walnut clocks, and we're working on twisting pianos at the moment. I'm so excited oh, about wow. They're looking beautiful. But the knotted clocks, even that, you know, after a while we realized, well, after what? realized we didn't want to make them in oak we should make them in walnut and i love american black walnut it's the most beautiful wood and it behaves well technically but these are big you need big trees you need big trunks so even that i had to get a shipping container of 10 logs from arizona they're like four meters long and over a meter diameter and that took about five months to come so even that even the the risk and ambition to pull off the clocks was huge but we were doing the clocks and then I got into bronzes. So we just started making lots of smaller work that could be collected and owned. And that was great. So creatively, I was enjoying it. Especially, it was another revenue stream into the studio. So it was great. Do the you make thing all is great, of these though. in your Kent farm factory or do you outsource these? No, all over the place. And they're made in different ways. Some parts are carved, some parts are machined. So, for instance, just over the last two years or so, we've been developing lampposts, cast iron lampposts. Well, it's been years, actually. It's been about four years, the, the cast iron lampposts. And that's a family of them. And we make straight ones. We, we're just finishing them. There'll, there'll be loads. But there's straight ones, but there's also ones tied in knots, tied in bows. They're very exciting. But those were, again, facilitation of fabrication. I've always got to be careful. When I talk about four years, like that, that's a lot of design work. And also a lot of refinement, technically, but also setting up to make lots. The, mm. the, the lampposts are a really good example, actually, like in the sense that it's now they're glazed and painted and they work. I wanted to make a public art that was a family object that was simultaneously functional. So the way that the lampposts will work is you could buy 10 straight ones and one in a bow or five different sculptural ones and that's it, whatever it is, you know, lots of different options. I thought it was really good to integrate function into public art and they can kind of go anywhere. So we had to design those so that we could make lots of them. That's quite complicated. I mean, it's very easy to make a one-off. It's not easy. It's hard. But So we designed those so that they could be made in cast iron, which feels right, but we had to refine that structurally and technically. And then it's about making the patterns. And the patterns are far, far more expensive and complicated than the actual objects themselves once the patterns exist you can make hundreds of the same part um mm -hmm. but it needs a lot of money a lot of money so part of that was design part of that was problem solving prototyping overcoming it working out how we're going to make them the engineering the foundation design but then it's about finding different partners to buy them off the sketch so that then the patterns are financed if you see what I mean. so with those um we we digitally design. We do all the design work and all the material prototyping. Then patterns are made by a company in Kent, actually, which is nice because I'm based in Kent. They're five axes machined with a robot, the patterns for those. They're cast in Kent by a different kind of company. And then we assemble those in, in Brighton with a company called Millimeter. And Millimeter have become really good fabricators of mine. So the thing to say is one of the strategies in terms of... Um, avoiding having a breakdown again was finding the right collaborators refining the work so it had a permanence and prototyping so that we weren't finding out problems on site and then making less in-house doing less less in-house a lot less so mm -hmm. in that action you remove a degree of stress there's always been so we've got it like a, one of our barns here is about ten thousand square feet and there's always been this discussion about, should we just set up all the fabrication here? And then you, you just, you take on the stress of not only running a small business as an artist, you take on the stress of being the fabricator and running that as a business. And also the responsibilities in terms of structure and material performance and longevity that come with that. So we've slowly 
developed some fantastic partners and fabricators and collaborators and and millimeter is one of them and i trust those guys they're brilliant so they do the assembly so we now design everything obviously um i obviously conceive every idea i oversee the design of it meticulously that takes months so all of the design work and digital work is by us but then a lot of the making now we use machines where we can sometimes hand is crucial uh for different reasons but we now manage the delivery of the artwork. So we kind of design them and manage their delivery and development. And I have to work with lots of different people. So I'm rarely ever here. I'm always on the road in meetings or uh, foundry visits or factory visits or site visits. But yeah. yeah, as I say, it's kind of the art design and facilitation. But also there's no time. Like I don't have time to make anything now. There's no time. <laughs> What would you say has been the top skill you've had to learn and hone to do the kind of work you do now? That's such a good question. The challenge, as I said, is remaining naive. Remaining naive and kind of foolishly ambitious amongst ever accumulating experience. That's very hard to strike that balance. When to turn your experience on? And when to turn it off. Because if it's on all the time, you'll never do anything. Because you're too aware of the obstacles. I think that's a very difficult question. I think, as I say, facilitation over fabrication. Facilitation is a real art form. And in the absence of facilitation, it's very hard to make something kind of ambitious materially exist. Mm-hmm. Um there's real shortcuts now. Like social media is, is a shortcut. Social media is a shortcut to success. And it's a shortcut to attention. You know, and this is, this is where comparison is the thief of joy and resentment creeps in. Because the problem with a lot of social media is that the, the success and the attention is very rarely deserved. You know, I mean, there's this nice saying, something like, you know, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Yeah. Right? And now it takes one post. It's like the game's changed a little bit, but th- something like Anselm Kiefer and the documentaries there, they just blissfully cement the idea of accumulating a legacy and of building a world. And that, you can't rush that. Hype is one thing, but quality and permanence is another. And, and all I trust now is, is quality. The initial works were wonderful in their theatricality and um, the immediacy of their their offering in every single way. But there was an absence of quality. And one thing I really trust now is quality. But what is my skill? I guess my skill uh, is the ability. I'm I'm good at knowing a little bit about everything. Mm -hmm. In the sense, if I sit in a structural engineering meeting, I, I, I'd like to think I make a very valuable contribution. If I sit in a marketing meeting, I make a very valuable contribution. If I sit in a technical meeting, if I have to give a lecture, if I'm meeting a commissioner, you know, you have to wear lots of different hats. And I know that there's this temptation as an artist to be like, no, 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 I, I've literally got a hat. But it's like, no, this is my hat and this is what I wear, how I wear. You know, like I only wear one hat, take it or leave it. That's great. That's great. But the reality in terms of delivering, um, projects in the public realm at scale or large yeah the scale is large so large projects in the public realm design demands flexibility and a degree of fluidity you know you have to wear different hats you have to be different people you know like if there's people on site and they're trades people and they they work and talk and act in a certain way i have to be able to have a good relationship and create a friendship or a positive dialogue with them in the same way that I, you know, the billionaire and owner of the company comes along and, you know, wants to have a chat. It, yeah. It's about wearing lots of different hats, I suppose, and somehow making them genuine. It's, mm-hmm. it's like my work, I suppose. It's all different, but there's this common visual language, sculptural language that travels through it. And you can, you can wear lots of different hats, but it's still you. And I guess that's the skill. 
Mm. But I can't stress enough the art facilitation and ambition, like ambition and risk. It's confusing time in terms of the, the idea of ambition and risk at the moment. And it's a frustrating time because we could spend a year working every single day to pull off, I don't know, a truck that does a loop-de-loop, -loop, right? That's made with a loop-de-loop. -loop. But we can render it in two days. You know, if we can digitally create something in two days that takes two years to make exist, that's complicated. So ambition and obsession are, are critical. That's really applying to the, the art of making things physically exist. Whether those things are so crucial in an ever digital age where the creation of the image, not the physical thing, but the image is so much, so much quicker, and so much less labor intensive. I don't know whether those things are so essential now. It's a very fast changing landscape. Yeah. And there was a time where I went really mad there was a time where I just went mad over uh, the comparative ease with which the digital image was being created versus the physical sculpture. But I've kind of made peace with it now. And what I do is create things that exist in the, in the tangible, the, the seemingly tangible world that surrounds us. I mean, your work almost looks like it could be AI generated, you know, like I looked through Instagram looking for people who do installation and often I come across something that's like monumental. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And then I'm like, uh, no, no, that's not real. That's AI. <laughs> and and yeah. your work could be, yeah. could be that, but it's not, it's real. In a way like that's, that's the perfect compliment. In the sense, like that defies logic, that shouldn't exist, yeah. that can't exist, that has to be digital. I don't know, maybe I'm one of the last of the, I don't know, last of the makers in that regard, but I hope that's not. a lovely thing to be. I hope not too, but, and maybe, maybe physicality and tangibility are, while humans exist in the kind of the physical sense that we do will always be a necessity. I certainly hope so. And I've got nothing against the digital art. I think where my frustration potentially comes is when people are selectively ambiguous about the fact it's digital or not. Mm -hmm. You know, like where, where they, they don't, don't say. Yeah, exactly. They don't say. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to names, but my word. My I'm... word. Also, there's some practitioners, right? And you see the word and they're like, wow. And everyone's like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? This is amazing. Wow. Blah, blah. Wow. And then occasionally they get commissioned to do something real. And it looks like it doesn't look good. It's like, hang on. That one doesn't look as, that one looks nothing like as good as all the, it's like, oh, okay, that one's going to, I'm not even going to say the material, but there are, yeah, big time, big time. And also be suspicious of people who are, showing lots of internal work like firstly be suspicious of someone who releases a new artwork every two days that's pretending to be real and where the background and floor are exactly the same in every single post <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and there's never any people no and there's always one view it's like come on like it's fine and this is the world we live in now but i i like to think that there'll be a necessary transparency or some kind of hallmark that distinguishes between a digital creation and a real thing, but maybe not. Yeah. But at the same time, what? okay, so tomorrow I could release over 100 artworks in that way. I could tomorrow release, release 100 different images, digital creations of public artworks. Some of them are great. But I, I still choose not to. I've always... I've battled with this. You can probably tell I've really battled with this, but I, at the moment, my, my current conclusion is to be patient and prioritize the kind of the physical materialization of these works over there, over the possible hype that their digital release might enjoy. Mm. Is that a good idea? I, I vote don't. for that. Yeah. Potentially. Well, thank you. I mean, it certainly doesn't, it might not be a good commercial decision. Um, it might not be a good marketing decision, but it feels like the right creative path. That's all I can go on. 
So it's a strange world in that regard. Have you ever worked on something for ages and it never actually became reality? Oh, all the time. All the time. We were working on a project for Milan Design Week 2019 that was another level, about a 40 meter wide kinetic building um, that we spent a long time. Yes, all the time, all the time. I mean, there are projects that people don't know about that we've spent thousands of hours on that didn't materialize. And it's lots of different reasons. So Milan 2019 was COVID. So that's a good example, that particular project. Now, we have um, we've done so much work on that project. Um, the structural engineering, the mechanical engineering, the digital design, the material prototyping, goes on and on. Um, significant investment. And the visuals exist in so many different formats. The digital animations exist. That's a good example. I mean, heartbreaking. Yeah. It, 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 I'm, I mean, I'm being dramatic and first world problems, but it tears me to pieces when these projects don't materialize, when you invest so much time. It just tears, tears me to pieces. But I resist the temptation to share it with the world in its digital existence because it will manifest again in the right time and the right place. It will happen again. Projects that we start and then are forced to stop there's quite a few of them now that are like one of them is being realized next summer, which is part fabricated. You know, it's been in a warehouse for a year because the project had to stop. Not because we did anything wrong, not because the commissioner did anything wrong, without going into details that that was a complicated situation where it wasn't allowed to continue anymore, even though everyone wanted it. Long story, really weird. It's to do with the waterways and, and, and um, neighboring land to the commissioner and the, everyone wanted it. But, Apart from one company, couldn't allow it. Long story, nothing to do with us. Anyway, um, that is being that part fabricated, but that is now going somewhere else where I think it'll be better next year. So it happens all the time, and it takes. Inc- do you know what the the thing I've got is stamina. That's it. That's coming back to the question of what's the one thing? It's stamina. It's stamina. Yeah, like creating public artworks when they get cancelled or they get delayed or they don't get as much attention as the last one did. Uh, attention's a funny thing. Like, So we know exactly what a crowd pleaser is. I know exactly now the buttons to press that will get lots of public praise and lots of media attention. But you can't, Sophie, my studio manager, she started to say, you know, this was one of the things where we pivoted. She was like, we've got to start making albums and stop making hit singles. Nice. And... At the time, I just didn't get it. It sounded great, <laughs> but I didn't get it, and it just began to make sense. Like We had to begin to build a broad and ever-expanding offering, creatively and commercially, in terms of the output. And I know like we've got things we'll probably do in the next two years. There's some things that, as I say, we're going to return to some of the sculptural simplicity. Look, we, we can build a... To build one sliding house from scratch, we could do that in a few months, but to build the foam box from scratch, which is twisting and it's got rippling glass, every single glass panel is different. You know, we had to work with the company uh, that does the glazing patterns for me to, just, to, just to get the glazing right. And that takes years. So I've gone down a path of varied size and sculptural complexity to kind of push my limits of sculptural exploration and how far we can push materials in their apparent fluidity or uh, whatever, you know. And now I feel like I'm in a place where I can sort of begin to return to things. Mm-hmm. So we'll do something very similar hopefully next year, like the slight house, but in a slightly different way. An absolute crowd pleaser. Mm-hmm. The lampposts are exciting for me. The lampposts are really exciting because they have this ability to go everywhere and anywhere. And I really like this idea of kind of raindrops of public art, positive public art all over the place. I think there's something really positive about that and optimistic and uplifting. 
And that's why we started to make our knotted post boxes. So the post box, the red post box is the UK thing. And that we made those in bronze and they're painted red. We made a few of those and they tore around the UK. So I like the idea that we we kind of owned and we were the commissioners and creators of our own public artwork. And you put a post box anywhere, in any town, in any street, it works because it belongs there because there's yeah. over 100,000 around the UK. So I kind of like this idea of creating public artworks as well that can go all over the place and anywhere. So, yeah, we're now at this nice place where we know how to do things in all materials, um, varying levels of complexity, lots of different sizes. And we're now in a place where we can return to all of them. You know, we can do all of it from the simple to the complex to the small to the challenging to the popular popular does always equal correct it's not always the best response the most popular one sometimes the one that's the least popular will eventually have the strongest degree of legacy or slowly develop the most important contribution over time and that's where the contextual response comes in can you yeah. tell me a bit more about the most recent facade works like the zipping ones in this case do you build everything on site do you prefabricate parts of it and then transport it how does it happen the project for milan was prefabricated um the two zipping buildings were prefabricated and then largely built on site so assembled on site um the one for milan was oh, i don't know 10 trucks something like that that's a huge team that was huge artwork did everything go smoothly with the transport of that? Yeah, that was pretty smooth. That one was pretty smooth. We've had some nightmares. Tell me. Well, just like the peeling road got stuck mm -hmm. once. Um, stuck? With a bridge. <sighs> yeah, well, I just they couldn't get under it, and we had to reroute. That wasn't our mistake, but... The logistics are stressful. The unzipping buildings were pretty straightforward. The unzipping buildings were interesting. So when I was at art school, I made this sheet of plywood that bends, and I put teeth in it and I unzipped it. And then eight, nine, ten years later, I created the unzipping building in Milan and the unzipping factory floor. That was nice because we excavated the floor. So that was like a meter deep when it zipped up, you could see inside. Wow. And the unzipping walls, they were great. But it was nice how I created this one unzipping piece of plywood when I was at art school. And I, I didn't know why. You know, you just follow your creative instincts. And then no one sees it. No one cares. You take a photo of it. Someone offered me, I think, 300 pounds for it. And then, I don't know, you know, within 10 years later, You've got hundreds of thousands of people pouring in a Milan Design Week to an unzipping building. It's really nice how, um, how as artists, you're kind of sowing these creative seeds. And they might seem small and irrelevant and pointless, or certainly underappreciated at the time. Yeah. But it's wonderful how they have the potential to grow. But like, you know, sickeningly, I'm saying that from the position of someone who's pulled it off. It's bloody hard to feel that way or adopt that philosophy when you just feel like you've been banging on the door for 20 years and no one's opening it. So we've been very lucky. That lucky is the wrong. Lucky is definitely the wrong word. But I'm fortunate that, you know, some of these big ideas have, have found mechanisms and, and platforms to exist. Certainly, I'm very pleased about that. What we need now, though, is a gallery. We're now making so much smaller work. It's very interesting. My work, for whatever reason, maybe it's popularity or maybe it's accessibility or playfulness. And there's a degree of whimsy with my work. Like They walk a fine line. I always say this, but my work walks a fine line between sculpture and stunt. I think we've toned down the stunt a little bit. And in the past, we probably got it wrong. Sometimes it's tipped too far into stunt. But it's always come from a place of kind of sculptural intent. And um, I think... Now we're a lot better at that. I think it's because a lot of the forms and a lot of the huge material manipulations wear a kind of a playful mask and they're full of narrative and to a degree whimsy. I don't really see it as whimsy, but I can see why people read it as that. But for whatever reason, 
it's never really chimed with a, a gallery world. So I've never really been, I've always felt like a tourist in the art world, always. Mm -hmm. um, my upbringing was in the art sector. But as I say, we, we're starting to make a lot of small work now that can be kind of owned. Yeah. I've never once been approached by a gallery in the UK or America. Never once. Wow, really? Yeah. Which maybe I'm being kind of an arrogant, you know, maybe this is just foolish arrogance. But I do find that a bit surprising. And particularly as we make a lot of smaller work now, uh, which, which finds collectors and, you know, finds buyers. But for whatever reason, UK and America never been approached by a gallery or a dealer. And there's something interesting about that. I don't know whether there's a disconnect between installation art or large public art and, and, and that kind of world. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, art dealers, if you're listening, there's a great opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe there is. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe you should just start your own gallery. Yeah, I think that too. But then, you know, there's not enough time anyway. Between, yeah. between three kids, the farm, and endless, endless amounts of sculptures, there's never any time. But it wasn't a complaint. It was just an observation, I suppose. I don't know whether the two worlds are slightly detached. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. It's, it's very hard to bridge the two. Like, I, I think it's very hard to make good, accessible public art and then desirable, collectible um, gallery-based work. They're, they require two different approaches. It, it happens. I mean, Kapoor does it well. Gormley does it brilliantly. Um, Richard Serra does it well. Michael Heiser does it beautifully. But, you know, Heiser and Serra, they're so uncompromising. But you do have to think differently. You have to really think differently. So it's hard. It's hard to do both, I think. Yeah. I have to wonder, like, is it yeah. maybe because if an artist becomes successful and popular independently and just because they make these very attractive and accessible works and not going through the traditional art world system, uh, then maybe they're a bit kind of an outsider then as well. Yeah, maybe. And there's something quite nice about that. There's something lovely about that. All I can do is to make the work that I want to make. That's all you can do as an artist. I mean, you can do, you can make the work that you think people want to see, but that's a terrible, that's a terrible foundation to build your creative output from. Mm. I've always enjoyed kind of serving my work on a bed of familiarity and accessibility in terms of kind of using the the material world around us as the basis and then disrupting that kind of playfully to lend the work and accessibility. And it potentially therefore runs the risk of being void of consideration. It's certainly void of conceptual. I've always avoided the BS. Like I've always avoided attaching BS on the end of something just to try and give it conceptual weight. That's not to say that conceptual work is BS. That's not that at all. It's just it wouldn't have been an authentic attachment to the work. But what the work is, is highly contextually responsive and very, very considered. Um, it just wears a kind of a playful mask. You know, an art, a brilliant artwork can be difficult, challenging, hard, um, almost unpleasant, but brilliant in such. But simultaneously, it can be positive, joyful, uplifting, and charming. And I guess I subscribe to the latter. I guess I subscribe to the latter, and I've never attached much conceptual weight to the work. Maybe that, I never, you know, I try not to overthink these things. You just have to get on with it and make the work that you want to make. Someone said, like, when I was trying to think about what to make, they said, well, if you walked into a gallery, what would you want to see? And I thought, yeah, that's nice. That's a pretty good way of going about it. So I've kind of always done that with the work. And going through the more traditional channels of, um, B A M A, dealer, gallery, selling lots of work, invitation to make a public artwork. I just didn't ever have the, I just didn't have the patience or mm -hmm. that just felt counterintuitive. I had the ideas and I had the energy and I had the appetite to make them happen now. So that's always what I did. 
And I think that's probably the best way to go about it now. Your approach is very different from what I'm used to. And it's very fresh and inspirational, I have to say. You've talked now about... Nice to hear. <laughs> the um, impermanence of your work. You know, a lot of your larger works are temporary. What happens to things like the floating building once the event is over? Well, partly why I needed a farm was because I like to keep lots of it. So, yeah, we keep large parts of it. Okay. So we would keep wind some columns and um, the temporary works, we keep a lot of it. The melting house, I can't remember the name of the company, but there was tons and tons of just melted wax with bits in it. That went to a firelighter company. I can't remember who they were called. Mm -hmm. But basically, we filled up a skit and that, well, more than one skit, and that went to a firelighter company. Some parts get destroyed. Yeah, a combination of destroyed, reused, but mainly stored. Mainly stored, yeah. And so one of my barns is like a reclamation yard. It's full of windows and columns and, and knotted columns and huge logs from Arizona, concrete rugs, uh, <laughs> lots of things. I mean, honestly, if I die tomorrow my poor wife will just have this this barn of just utter baggage you know it's like so we can't move now because there's so much stuff in there yeah. but yeah it's kind of a combination of things the thing about so it, it takes a while to get good at permanent art that's hard temporary art is it's not, it's not easy and it depends what you're making, but it's a lot easier. So with temporary work, you, you have a creative freedom. That's for sure. Permanence is a little bit of a cage to creative freedom. With impermanent work, you have far less material restrictions. So your material palette is much broader because material longevity is less of a concern. In terms of the conceptual or contextual response, you have tremendous freedom. So, you know, if you're installing something on Covent Garden Piazza in front of a very historic building, you can do that if it's there for a month, but you're never going to be allowed to do that if it's there for 10 years. So you have administration freedom. Now, in terms of permanence, you have to design the artwork utterly with permanence in mind. So your material decisions, your technical decisions, um, just the manual. I mean, the manual that comes with our lamppost is still like 30 pages long. Wow. You, you, you have to take a different approach. Conceptually, contextually, creatively, technically, materially, it's a very different thing. And it's, it's harder. So it's taken us some time to get good at permanent public art. And I think, I like to think we're really getting there. The trouble is to refine your practice and learn lessons, you have to you have to learn them on a very public stage. This isn't to say that anything we've created is wrong. It's just, I think we're getting better. Um, I love the temporary work. I love it. And the, the theatricality and the freedom that it permits. But I also think there's a place for longer lasting work. And we, we really spend time on both, actually. One is about just creating hype and one is about trying to kind of contribute to history i guess mm -hmm. um one is about animated space but another is about elevating it there's slightly different approaches creatively you know we've invested a lot of time and effort into getting good at both the budgets are bigger with permanence which is obviously a kind of an attractive consideration but having said all of this i really think that permanent art needs to be open to the idea of being removed after a period of time. It's very possible that a public artwork no longer makes a positive contribution after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, for whatever. Whether it just feels a bit lifeless in the context, because the context has changed around it, whether it simply needs refurbishment, like whether it's, it's fatigued to a point of making a 
not a positive contribution, but a negative one. Or whether, for whatever reason, it's done its job and its contribution and legacy would be kind of more valuable in, in its absence, like it's done. I think that people need to be open to that because public art is tricky, as hard as it is. Firstly, as I say, you're quite often dealing with people who haven't done it much before. And yeah, you might be in your studio and you make 100 paintings and after 100 paintings, you get stuck in good. But with public art, you're going to make 100 not so good pieces before you start getting good. And that means there's a lot of bad public art out there. The other problem with public art is that the funding, the funding, so you've got a lot of inexperienced practitioners creating public art. And the commissioner has a responsibility to make sure it's permanent for whatever reason, the local council, local authority, to justify the spend, it needs to be permanent. So for all of those reasons, you've got a lot of inexperienced practitioners delivering long-lasting public art, and that's a bad recipe. The other problem is, is budgets. It's so often seen to, as a requirement and not a necessity. You know, no art is a necessity. Like, no individual artwork is a necessity. But the collective impact and offering and, and social role that the arts play is an absolute necessity. But no individual artwork is. And it's often a requirement at the end of something, a much bigger spend. Um, let's say the best example is developers. And developers are arguably the best commissioners of public artworks in the world. It's wonderful. You know, and a good developer who has the right philosophy can facilitate wonderful, wonderful public artworks. But quite often, it's an unwelcome requirement and they minimize the spend on it. And ultimately, what you're left with is an exquisite building with wonderful public realm spend, like, you know, architects creating brilliant buildings with fantastic budgets and this kind of afterthought and after spend on a, a requirement of public art. And it, you know, don't get me wrong, that's great. It's better than nothing, but it just presents public art in probably a negative light against the backdrop of brilliant architecture. So what I'm getting at is it adds up, potentially accumulates to a risk that there's a lot of bad public artworks out there. And there are. And look, maybe I'm responsible for some of them. But firstly, it's very difficult to develop the experience in terms of understanding what makes a good public artwork and how you make it, um, certainly in a permanent sense, and also being open to the idea of removing it. So a lot of our contracts now, we have this kind of freedom to, we certainly have 10-year arrangements in place to discuss whether it would be better removed. You know, And that's not like the, to turn commissioners off. It's just the truth. That's experience. Yeah. That's experience. So, yeah, it's a complicated field. It's a difficult field. I love it, though. So where is some public art that people can go and look at now of your work? Well, right now we have, where do we have? We have a few post boxes around the UK. We have the exploding spiral staircase in Brighton. That was hard. Mm -hmm. That's a 35 meter spark staircase that unravels and explodes in all directions. It looks insane. Yeah, that one's hard. That one's hard. I mean, the form is beautiful. That, that one's one of those rare sculptures that from the side is probably more beautiful from the front. But that's full of narrative and that's, that, that's in Brighton. Then our inverted electricity pylon is in London on the Greenwich Peninsula. And then we have a cracked building, huge cracked facade in Hammersmith in London. And then we're installing a couple of bronze post boxes next year, uh, lots of lamp posts, hopefully around Europe, but certainly in the UK. And uh, in Nancy in France, there's a series of um, metal sculptures on buildings. And then in the summer, as I say, we're installing this new uh, permanent public artwork in the UK, which would be wonderful. I'm very excited about. So yeah, all over the place. They're, they're all over the place, basically. And next year is a kind of a combination of temporary works and um, permanent works. But we're beginning to self-facilitate again. We're beginning to go out and find derelict buildings again, mm. which is really exciting. I'll be looking forward to seeing that. And also, we're developing something for America. We're developing a, a series of 50 sculptures for America that I'm excited about, really excited about. 
So yeah, all over the place. It never ends. It never ends. It's an exhausting, never ending journey. I think that's what an <laughs> artist is. This kind, yep. of, this kind of blissful, torturous, never ending journey. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. So what would you say has been the proudest moment of your career so far? Well, I think at the beginning when I had never made a public artwork before and I'd been going in and out of this derelict factory with all of the soil and, you know, rats and asbestos and foxes. When I stepped back and I created the 312 identically smashed windows, that, that was a real moment. That was a real moment. And then the, the positive attention and the media response that it enjoyed, that really felt for the first time like the input and the recognition were close for the first mm -hmm. time. That was the first time there'd ever been a relationship between enormous input and a sense of acknowledgement. So that was a big one. Um, but there's been lots of kind of personal moments I mean, look, there's been lots of moments where people have come or people have seen things and, you know, brought me to tears for different reasons. But I think probably the most beautiful moment I've ever had was um, I just finished the unzipping building in Milan. And that was, that was a big artwork. And we got it right. It was, we really got that one right in every way. And inside there was this wonderful unzipping floor I loved, which is where we excavated the factory floor, re-poured a new floor, so it's peeling up and you could look down under the floor. And then there was this huge unzipping wall on the inside as well. And I couldn't sleep and I woke up, I was in the hotel in Milan, it was about 5 a.m., hotel got me a cab, and I went to the site. It was just me and there was just me and security guards. And I walked around it and I had headphones on and I was playing the, the latest Tom York album, which is beautiful. And it was just the most exquisite feeling. Like there was just, it was just me and the work at 5 a.m. And I allowed myself a rare sense of accomplishment. Coming back to one of the first questions you asked, one of my two favorite quotes, well, is only the paranoid survive. And, um, I think the way that I kind of deal with that is I, I have this incredible kind of creative anxiety as a practitioner. And the way I solve that is by just working extremely hard and taking risks. And I very rarely, when I complete an artwork, there's never a sense, there's very, very, very rarely a sense of accomplishment. It's just I'm on to the next. You know, I'm done with the last, I'm on to the next. And That's not because I don't like the work or because I don't want to give value to the work. It's just because I think it's born from this notion of only the paranoid survive and this kind of ever ongoing anxiety to keep producing. And there, in that moment at 5 a.m. in Milan, surrounded by these three artworks, I, I felt a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Like I kind of allowed myself to feel proud of that. And that was a wonderful feeling. That was a that was really, really beautiful morning. Just that half an hour. Then I'm back on email panicking about the next projects. So <laughs> that was a lovely little moment. Yeah. I mean, when I look back retrospectively, I'm really, I'm really proud of the portfolio that I've accumulated. Like the portfolio means so much to me. And, I, and at the time when I'm knee deep in the projects, it feels stressful or irrelevant. You know, I mean, it's a kind of creative journey that everyone goes on. You have the idea, you think it's the best thing that's ever been made. You start looking into it, you realize this is really hard to achieve. Then halfway through, you start thinking, is it any good? Then you finish it, you think, oh, it's great. And it all happens so quickly. But sometimes you need like eight years or so to look back and say, that was good. That was, that was worthwhile. We need to explore that again. So I'm only just getting into that territory. It's been 10 year whirlwind of sculpture after sculpture after sculpture after sculpture. So now we're slowly getting into a place where we can begin to kind of calm it down and start to think about going back and sometimes the best way to go forward is to go back a little bit 
So next year, we're going to do an identically smashed window piece again. And it's been 10 years since we did that one. I was always terrified of repetition. I always felt that repetition represented the point where you'd run out of ideas. But I think there's, there's something to be said for it. I always say there's a fine line between repetition and refinement. And I think now, because we make such different work and so many different materials and processes and people, um, I think now I can kind of justify the idea of exploring refinement a little bit. Mm, yeah. yeah. I definitely love a little self-reference moment to like previous work. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Mm. It's needed, I suppose. It's needed. It's it's like when you find an old sketchbook or something, a sketchbook from eight years ago, and you flick through and you kind of stumble upon a doodle of an idea, and you think, oh, that was good. Mm -hmm. That was good. But at the time, for whatever reason, you just kind of, at the time, it just didn't feel right. So yeah, slowly becoming, begin, allow myself to look back a little bit. Yeah. Hence why I agreed to this. I don't normally agree. Like I don't normally do. Like I'm starting to do interviews again. I stopped as well. That was another thing I did. I stopped. Why? But I think it's okay to. Do again. I think there was a time in the world where you just couldn't win, uh, and maybe that's now still. Maybe I've made peace of it. I just think like there was a time, particularly during COVID, where anything you said left you open for attack. And there comes a point where you've just got to say, well, you just got to take the risk, you know, and just be able to have conversations. There was this real time where anything you said left you open for attack and any opportunity for people to release animosity or to kind of vent, they would take it. It just felt like society became a search party for fault. And it was just not looking for anything that anyone was doing right. It's just trying to find anything that anyone could do wrong. And that, that society coming from a deeply negative place. And that's not a collaborative society. That's antagonistic and tense. And I just didn't want to play that game. And now I'm open to it again, maybe because I'm just tired of feeling that way or whether I feel like potentially that tension has reduced somewhat. Maybe it hasn't at all. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I hope this podcast is a safe space. And um, I think this has been a delightful and inspiring conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for caring. Thanks for asking the questions. I appreciate it. It's nice to go on a little journey. Yeah, I've really enjoyed learning from you. And I appreciate your perspective. It's given me a lot of food for thought. I think I'm going to incorporate some of the lessons you've just taught me today about oh. facilitation over fabrication. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. It's funny, whenever I say, oh, this worked for three years or something, there's always someone who's a maker or a fabricator who's like, three years? Well, I could do that in two months. It's like, yeah. Facilitation and fabrication, they're two very, very, very different things. But maybe I'm really talking to sculptors there. I, I mean, obviously, I'm talking to makers and architects and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Like the things I've pulled off are not mind blowing in the context of architecture. But architecture has got a different set of parameters and rules. It's, it's like this would never happen, could never happen probably should never happen you know like yeah. art is liberated by the absence of function like i know that art has a function if anyone i know art has a function it's just not in its kind of physical sense let's say whereas a building does and function facilitates enormous budgets because of its obvious need art while it has a different kind of social function i know <laughs> I, I'm not talking to you while I, I just, I, I, it, it's a different set of parameters, a different set of budgets, but it permits this creative freedom that is to a degree where possible unbound by function or the need to perform. So in some ways, creatively, it has limitless possibility, but in terms of resource, it has very finite possibility. And um, I guess what I've always tried to do is use that limitless creative energy 
to try and stretch the boundaries of resource and possibility and achievability um, as much as possible. And that's kind of what I've always continued to do. So I guess whatever kind of practitioner you are, there's something to be said for that, I suppose, in the arts. Because I, I mean, the arts is a funny thing. I, I say it doesn't have a function, of course. As I said, an individual artwork is not crucial, but the arts in general are essential. And yes, the creation of pleasure is not more important than the prevention of pain, obviously. The prevention of pain should always come first. I'm not suggesting it shouldn't. But in a world where there is pain, there's also the opportunity for pleasure. The existence of the arts is essential. Um, and the kind of the positive role it can play and the escapism from reality that it can offer. There's so much to be said for that. And so without kind of becoming over pretentious about the value of art and the arts, I do certainly think public art has a role to play and a positive role to play. And it shouldn't always be with this kind of this, this attack of it being frivolous. It's not, but it does have a role. You know, hopefully the creation of pleasure can play some small role as well, hopefully. I think it does. You've worked with so many tradies and people whose main job is building an architecture. Have you ever had to, like, I don't know, explain to them why why you're doing what you're doing and why it's not needed to be done in the way they usually do things because X, Y, Z? Yeah, absolutely. All the time. <laughs> All the time. The right collaborators kind of see the value in it. And quite often the right collaborators welcome the, the shift. Um, like you might be working on a particular project where someone does something all the time in exactly the same way. And they get invigorated by the invitation and the, the challenge to use their skill set in a different way or a new way. Normally that happens. And I really enjoy that. But yeah, you've got to, I don't know, you've got to try and take everyone on the journey as much as possible. The audience, of course, but the people creating the artwork with you. Yeah, normally it's, it's good. Normally, as I say, the right collaborators take it on and the right collaborators welcome the shift in their day-to-day -day activity, I suppose. And I don't know, I like to think, I mean... You'd have to ask them, and they probably not. Maybe they wouldn't disagree. But I like to think that a lot of the time, the, all the different people we work with step back and are really proud of the work that they've created. I hope so. I hope so. Because, like, obviously, none of the work would exist without me. Every single one of these projects, if if you took me out, it wouldn't be. There. But a lot of them individually would not have been possible, would not exist as well as they do without the collaborators and the people involved. I mean, there's been so many people. An early collaborator was a man called Richard Nutbourne, uh, Richard Nutbourne Scenic Studio, who do scenic work and painting. And he's just a master of his craft, absolute master of his craft. And that early work was really brought to life with him. I mean, he's just one of many, but there's been so many crude collaborators. Uh, Jonathan, who I work with, is just a brilliant, brilliant craftsman. But everyone's brilliant in their different way. As I say, Sophie, my studio manager, she's just brilliant at what she does. And so, yeah, if you took a lot of these people away, the work wouldn't be half as good. So I hope they're proud. I hope they're individually proud of the work that we create together. Yeah. Well, I would love to stay here and ask you a million more questions, but <laughs> I think if I stay much longer than the alarm in the building will go off because <laughs> it automatically turns on. It's good. I've got to go for lunch with Tony, the wax man, anyway. Oh, yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Um, where should the listeners go to check out your work, maybe buy something, look at things, follow you? Well, the buying is possible but tricky. In the, no, no, that's a terrible answer. This is why. This is why I need a good dealer. Um, the buying is possible, but you know the, the ownable artworks are—they're um, not inexpensive. You know, this is, they're made in bronze and silver. But the best place to see the work is the website. 
which is alexchinnock.com, A-L-E-X-C-H-I-N-N-E-C-K.com, alexchinnock.com. If you look at the website, we put a lot of time into photography and we work with lots of different photographers around the world. And the photography of the work is a huge part of it, huge part yeah. of the process and the project. So the website's a lovely place to see that. And that shows all of the projects in more detail. So I think there on Instagram, it's at Alex Chinook, which, you know, I probably don't use as effectively as I should, but certainly when we're creating new work, it's on there. So alexchinook.com and at Alex Chinook on Instagram. They're the two places to kind of see and hopefully enjoy the work. Yep. We'll have yep. all the links in the show notes. Thanks. Well, there you go. That's it. That's me. Well, thanks again, Alex. It's been a real pleasure. I'm really tired now because it's almost 11 p.m. here, but um, that's not yeah. an indication of my level of excitement. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Wow. Right? How amazing is Alex and his work? I feel so privileged to have had this conversation and I am super inspired. Like, what am I even doing with my life? That was British artist Alex Chinnock, based in Kent, UK. You must go check out his work on his website, alexchinnock.com, and his Instagram, at alexchinnock. All links are in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you hit follow or subscribe, and consider leaving us a five-star review. It really helps other listeners find us. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Installation Art Podcast.